What inspired me was, um, and is, continues to be, but continues to inspire me, is a primal and fundamental desire to fulfill the highest expression of myself as a human being. I don't want to die not having completely burnt out every single possibility of my humanity. I just, I just want to, I, when, when I leave this planet, I want everybody to say, you did that, used it all up, not another thing I could do. There wasn't another person I could have given of myself to. There wasn't another deed I could have done. Sure. There wasn't anything that you just want to, you want to say, I want to fill it up. You want to take this whole human existence, which when you think about it, Godfrey, is really pretty damn miraculous. It is. It is. It is. When you think about what it means to be a human being on the planet Earth right now, that's pretty awesome. So I just want to, I want, I want to, I want to take that to the max. Mm -hmm. I want to say, mm -hmm. no need to come back as a human. Angel status. This is what people don't know, because you can't tell everybody. I am who I am. One black woman, my hand in God's hand, trusting in that word, because that word never failed me. And I got to where I am, and I stand as I am, as Maya Angelou often says, and often said, and says in her poem to our grandmothers, every time you see me, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. Every time you see me, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. So it's just not me standing up here. It's every, it's my mother, my grandmother, her mother, the mother before her, her grandfather, every uncle who prayed, every sister who cried, every aunt who sacrificed, those whose names made the history books, those whose names never could make the history books, who allowed me to come as one and stand as 10,000. So oftentimes when I walk into a room just as cool as you please, and I can't see another black face in a 50 mile radius, I stand and sit at the boards as one, but I'm bringing the 10,000 behind me because I not only know who I am, but I also know whose I am. And so anything you hear about me that feels good, sounds good, you think about, I wonder what Oprah's doing, how she's doing, I, I am living the dream. And I want you to live the dream because I'm not living the dream because I'm special. I'm living the dream because I was obedient to the call of the dream. So I want you to leave here today thinking about what is the dream for you? What is God's dream for you? What does the creator's dream hold for you? So often we spend our lives wishing and hoping and hoping and wishing and desiring things. This is what I know for sure. You don't get what you wish for. You don't even get what you hope for. You get what you believe. So what is it you believe and know to be God's dream for you? So I live in the dream. I'm living in the space of the dream. And dream's good. Dream's good. The dream is greater than anything that I could have imagined. You know, when I was a little girl, my father... On Sunday mornings after church, he was a deacon, so he thought he had to say goodbye to every single person. We were the last car leaving the parking lot in the green Oldsmobile. And we would drive through the white people's neighborhoods. And I used to dream the dream driving through the white people's neighborhoods. We'd drive through the white people's neighborhoods and you'd see their fancy houses. Some of them had gates, but all of them had trees. And I remember when I first came to Baltimore, I met a friend, hello Baltimore in the house. When I first came to Baltimore, I, I, I made friends with a wonderful woman named Arlene Weiner. She was the wealthiest person I'd ever met. And I went to her house and parked in the driveway. There was a Corvette and there was a BMW and there was a Mercedes. I went, whoa, Arlene's rich. And at Arlene's house, once I got inside, 
I could see from her kitchen window six trees in the front yard. I thought, oh, rich people have trees. When I get rich, I'm going to get me some trees. I'm not just going to get me. Everybody want to get cars and pocketbooks and shoes, but I want me some trees. So as life would have it, I was standing in my kitchen window about three years ago in California making coffee in the morning, and I was looking out the window, and I saw the six trees. But listen to me. I was making, making, making the coffee. I saw the six trees. I went out on the porch to actually count the six trees. And this is what I noticed, that I could dream the six, but beyond the six trees, in my kitchen window are 3,687 trees. How do I know? Because I had them counted. I had them counted. Because so I said, I want to know how many trees out there. I dreamed the six. That's as much as my, 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 my small mind and my imagination could hold for myself. I dreamed the six but God can see beyond the six. Can see beyond the six because there was a bigger dream for me. And I'm here to tell you there is a bigger dream for you, Essence. There's a bigger dream. And so the key, the secret, the magic is to surrender to God's dream for you. To quit fighting against and pushing against and disallowing against and resisting against and trying to tell the creator, the universal forces, divine intelligence, what you are supposed to do and get still and know for sure what his dream, the dream, is for you. I did this at the end of my uh, sh uh, show. I did my favorite guest of all times. And that's hard to do out of literally th thousands and thousands. They, they, they supposedly estimated lines. that there's like 35,000 people I interviewed over the years. But there was one woman out of all the celebrities, out of all of the famous, non-famous, infamous people, one woman. Who was Zim she? Who was she? Her name is Terai Trent. Listen to this story. I'm going to try to shorten it for you, Please Godfrey. Do. Okay. Terai Trent, born and raised in a village in Zimbabwe. 11 years old. She's doing her brother's homework. She wants to go to school. Her father says, no, you're Gail. You have, to, you have to educate the boy first. Yep, that's right. That was the I, tradition. That's right. The boy has to go to school. You can't go to school. So she starts doing her brother's homework. She does his her brother's homework. He goes to school. He gets all A's on his homework, yet he doesn't know the answer to the question. The teacher comes to the village to say, what is going on here? This boy doesn't know the answers, but his homework's perfect. She finds out that Terai, his younger sister, is doing his homework. She begs the father to let Terai go to school. The father says, no, she can't go to school. Finally, he marries her off. She marries at 11 and a half years old. She gets married. She has three children by the time she's 18 years old. A woman comes to the village from an NGO, Heifer International, and ask, what are your dreams? This is gonna make me cry. Finally, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> ask her, what are your dreams? This child has never thought about what her dreams were. She says, write down your dreams. She writes down her dreams on a piece of paper and she folds them in a tin can and she buries them under a rock. The oh, first dream was to be able to go to, the school in, go to a school in the United States of America and get a college degree. She ends up through some miracle of the NGO, going to the United States. She wow. gets a college degree. Wow. Yes, she gets a four-year degree in three years. Uh -huh. Tara Trent. She goes back to the rock in Zimbabwe. She writes her next goal on the piece of paper. She buries it under the rock. She writes, I want to get a master's degree. She goes back to the United States. She gets a master's degree. By this time, she now has five children. She's married to a man who still oh, beats her. Incredible. incredible. She goes back to the United States. She gets her master's degree. 
After the master's degree, she goes back to the rock in Zimbabwe. She writes down her final goal is to get a doctorate degree. And last year, she became Dr. Tararai Trent. Where did you find it? Where did I find it? Um, I found her in the, in the Nicholas Kristof's book called uh, Something the Sky. Underneath the sky or the sky. I, Nicol, I found her in Nicholas Kristof's book. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Incredible. And I was reading the story. I had Nicholas Kristof on the show. Nicholas Kristof, the famous New York Times writer. And she wasn't there. She wasn't a part of the show. I'm reading the story. I can't believe this book, the story of this woman, as I'm reading the story. So when we go to do the show, the producers have Nicholas Kristof on. They bring on other guests, but this woman isn't there. I go, how, how could you not have her there? So we tape another show with Nicholas Kristof. We go back, I go, fine, we're gonna find that woman, Tara Wright Trent. This time, by this time, she's living in the United States. We followed her back to Zimbabwe, to the rock. We pulled the tin can from underneath the rock. And that is my favorite guest of all time. And the worst? Um, I don't have a worst. I don't have a worse. But the reason why she, and, and as I said this on my show, the reason why Tara Rye Trent is my favorite guest of all time is because she represents in that one story of the little girl in a village in Zimbabwe who had a dream and the heart and depth and discipline to pursue it. She represents everything I tried to say in every show in 25 years. She literally, through her life story, sums up the message that I was trying to give to every single one of my viewers. You can, you can, keep trying, don't give up. You have to believe. You have to believe. First day I went to school, I was in a classroom. By the time I was, uh, you know, six years old, didn't go to school till I was six years old because I lived with my grandmother at that time. Sure. But she had taught me how to read, read the Bible, Bible stories. So I went into the classroom knowing Nicodemus, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I could spell all of those words. I thought I was, you know, I was preaching to, the, to my kindergarten teacher. To adult, huh? <laughs> so <laughs> she was like, who is this girl? <laughs> so I was never placed in an environment mm -hmm. where I was ever made to feel inferior. I always felt like I'm the smartest kid in this room. And because I was never placed in a, in a, never put in a position where I was made to feel less than, sure. I didn't grow up feeling less than, you right. know? And the rest, as they say, is history. And because the rest, they say, is history. The... And it's all about what you believe. You know, yeah. I say this to, uh, when I, I do something on my network now called Life Class, the fundamental key to success is what you believe is true for yourself, not what you want, not what you desire. It's what do you believe? You know, you can say, I want to, I want to be the most successful person in the world. Yeah. But if you believe that there's a glass ceiling and you're going to have a hard time kicking through that glass ceiling, keep yourself you will down. be defined by the glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. And um, the great beauty and gift of my life is that I was never defined by the box that other people tried to put me in. Have you ever seen her before? I've been driving her does she look time. like Oprah Winfrey to you? She does. That's yes. her. That's her. <laughs> She doesn't look like herself? Yeah, I am. Can't over. you really are? Really? <laughs> Staying in the teepee. Teepee one. But don't tell anyone we're here. Okay, what's the zip code for me? Oh my. Oh, 6060. <laughs> You be the penis. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's limp. It's Nobody limp. has ever said that to me. <laughs> I have been talking to people my whole life, and nobody has ever said, you be the penis. <laughs> this is a letter I wrote to Anthony Odie. I was such a geek. Um, <laughs> it says, on today, June 22nd, 1971, I've decided to voice my thoughts on paper to to prevent my brain from becoming disrupted. Oh my God. <laughs> Voice my thoughts on paper? That was in high school? That was, that was in high school, oh. June 22nd, okay. <clears throat> She's always been very dramatic, don't you think? Yeah. Today is my ninth anniversary with Anthony, nine months today. Never thought I'd make it this far. Oh. <laughs>
My father says, oh, there we were. <laughs> There's me with the flip. That was the Marlo Thomas, that girl flip. Um, my father says, stay at home and rest. Doesn't he know that love knows no rest? Oh. <laughs> Nice vest, Anthony. <laughs> that for those who love, time is not. Oh. I love Anthony. I really, truly, truly love him. Truly, truly, truly. And oh. I don't give a blank. I use the blanks in case my father ever found the letters. I wouldn't be cursing. <laughs> whether or not people think it's proper or whether I'm too aggressive or flipped for him because I don't think God will mind. There's so, <laughs> there's so much hatred in the world. I should think God would be happy to see a little love flowing every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> 